Hi, I just wanted to do a super quick video or super quick reaction to what we're seeing on the stock markets at the moment. Um, so normally I talk about artificial intelligence and the impact on the economy. Um, so I want to try and analyze what we're actually seeing here. Um, is it just a correction? Uh, is it a move to a more deflationary environment with more unemployment? Is it a true stock market crash? What we've been seeing is uh, Bitcoin down about 13%, Ethereum down quite a lot more, I think around 21%. The Japanese market has been down, uh, I think it's 13% overnight. And um, Friday was pretty bloody on the US stock market. And what we're seeing right now is that the, the German stock market is continuing down or the European stock markets are continuing down. So what can we expect? Um, I have Lars Tvede here on the call, who is um, an investor and venture capitalist and has a very deep knowledge about what could be going on right now. Welcome, Lars. This reminds me most of what we saw in 1987, where we had this uh, brutal flash crash um, and then markets fell a lot, became technically what you call oversold and then they uh, rebounded and there was actually nothing really wrong with the economy. And, and when it was all over, everybody was just like, what just happened? And I just want to talk about this, about um, the economic context. So if we start with the two economies, maybe, you know, China and the US, uh, if you look at the US first, there's normally when you get a recession, so people are afraid of recession, you have two things that trigger that. First of all, there's some structural uh, problems somewhere in the economy. The banks are in trouble, the real estate sector is in trouble, the consumers are in trouble, something like that. And when you look at the American economy today, there is no big strategic problem anywhere in, in, in the economy. If I should point to anything, there's, a, there's something in commercial real estate offices, for instance, where there, there are quite a lot of empty building, but it doesn't impact the economy very much. The big, the big part of the economy is the consumers. Uh, it's about 70% of GDP comes from private consumption. And uh, some people have been concerned about a graph or some numbers that they see, which uh, shows that um, there was this excess saving during the COVID lockdown in the US as well as in, in Europe and many other places where people got paid for not working, for staying at home. Um, they didn't spend much of the money because they couldn't go on holiday, they couldn't go on restaurants and so on. So uh, enormous amounts of savings piled up, and then you can you can see how these excess savings have been drawn down month by month by month, and then in the U.S. a couple of months ago, they that that calculation went down to zero, and then some people conclude that oh then they don't have any savings anymore, but that's not the case. They still save. They're back to kind of the traditional savings rate. And if you look at their net assets, so the value of what they own minus what they they owe, um, that's that that's <laughs> the worst all time high. I think Friday is probably uh, knocked down by the markets right now, but it's still very very high. So the consumers are solid, so that's not really a big uh, issue there. Um, then people have been worrying worried about the uh, valuation of the Magnificent Seven. Uh, which has been largely supported by you know very enthusiastic attitudes to AI and all the investments in it. And then the attitudes uh, the last few weeks swung around where people said, but will they get a return for the hundreds of billions of dollars they're investing in uh, foundational LLM models, for instance? And the short-term answer is for sure, no. <laughs> um, but you and I have uh, worked a lot with AI. You even have an AI consulting company. And we know how, how enormously powerful <clears throat> AI will be in support productivity across all levels. Uh, first, um, digital work, pure digital work, so desk work. But later, we'll also have uh, hyper-intelligent robots. Um, so there, <clears throat> there will be a lot of money in this. 
Um, so the situation in the U.S. Uh, is that the interest rates have been held high um, because the Fed wants to see inflation go down to their target or towards that close, you know, trend clearly trend down to the target of two percent. Um, what is relevant there is to look at forward indicators for inflation. Um, so what the Fed looks at as 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 this, what they're they're mainly trying to manage is something called core inflation. So this is a part of inflation that's not so volatile, you know, with big changes in monthly numbers. And 40% of core inflation comes from real, from shelter. So the cost of um, your apartment, your house, whether you rent or, or, or own it. And that the shelter component of core inflation was very stubborn, it was too high, but, it, but forward looking indicators for it and I follow especially five, have all been trending dramatically down. And now in the la latest readings, the, the actual core inflation number has also been trending down. So I think there's every indication that inflation uh, will come further down. And there's even, um, I subscribe to something called Alpine, Alpine Macro, which is an international research institute. They have an inflation model that indicate that they will have deflation so prices, consumer prices will begin to fall next year. Whether that actually happens, I don't know. But I think that the inflation that we have experienced across the, the globe has been like a ghost that walks through the room, comes in through one door, walks through it, looks very scary, and then it walks out through the other door. Uh, and it's, uh, we only had in that inflation because of uh, excessive well, because we paid people for, for not working, that means we produced money that was not matched with production during the COVID lockdowns. This is, uh, we are almost through this. A uh, number of, of countries are entirely through it, uh, including Switzerland, where I live, where, and Denmark, where I come from, where there has actually been some prints of, uh, of um, disinflation, so negative inflation. Uh, so... It's really over and the Fed has a dual mandate. They have to uh, control inflation, but they also have to look uh, and prioritize employment. And they have already begun to mention that uh, they are taking this into consideration. So last time I checked, which was a few minutes ago, uh, the price, the market was pricing in a 60% chance of an extraordinary rate cut in the US next week. Uh, so normally, you know, the consensus had been that they would make one in September and one in December. Initially, people expected 25 basis points each time. Recently, they've been talking about 50 basis points, but they might act uh, faster. So this is the U.S. China is a more mixed story uh, because the, the business cycle element of the Chinese economy is absolutely horrible. Um, they have uh, had this very, very big part of GDP has been from real estate. 25 to 30% of GDP uh, were related to development of real estate and everything that goes around that. Whereas in a normal developed uh, nation or economy, it's, it's typically closer to 12 to 15%. So very excessive activity in real estate. And now real estate prices are dropping. Nobody wants to invest in it. Uh, they have a lot that has been bought, uh, but is not being built and so on. So they have this big the problem that they have to deal with. And they have taken some initiatives, yet they're just not big enough at all. There was one initiative that would uh, yeah, help local governments scoop up uh, some of the sold but not built property. But when you look at it, it's only 0.8% of the problem. Uh, so they need to do a lot more. Uh, and also they come up with this bullish uh, prediction of 5.5% economic growth uh, for this year. Um, it's very hard for them to achieve that unless they, they do a lot more. So they need to come with some something economists call a bazooka, something really uh, strong. Um, quantitative easing would be a way. On the other hand, if uh, on the long term, the Chinese economy has massive growth potential. It's, it's incredibly innovative, as, as you and I have often discussed. Um, so it could e easily triple or quadruple its GDP per capita uh, during the rest of this century. Um, 
but uh, so that that's a bigger uh, question mark. So when it comes to what we see in the markets, uh, led by this uh, vertical vertical jump, uh, <laughs> not jump drop in Nikkei, looks to me like a technical, very strong technical uh, reaction that feeds on itself. Um, lots of markets are extremely oversold, so it could very difficult to make predictions in these kind of situations, but it could stop around here actually. Typically when these kind of things stop, they zigzag for some days. Um, and then when, you know, <laughs> sig up, sag down, sig up, sag down. And when people realize it can't go any further down, then people, some, some investors come in and say, okay, let's buy it. It's very oversold. It's good value at these points. So, so do you think the stock market as it is right now is, is good value? Um, I think uh, parts of the stock market uh, is good value. Uh, if we start with Nikkei, I mean, Nikkei was selling at, uh, as far as I remember, forward PE of 22 before this. Uh, now it's been taken down substantially, so it's, it's a le at, at least a pretty good value. Um, I think um, I mean, you have you have things like one of my long-term favorites is uh, Greek bank shares which are trading at forward PE of five, something like that. So any shield of, of 20% or close to 20% in uh, in an economy that's doing really well. Uh, I just noticed UBS came out with coverage of them, was it last week, with buy recommendations of all, I agreed with us. Um, I've been a long-term fan of metals and mining, including gold and silver mines and uranium. I think the long-term case for these are very, it's very, very strong, but they're being held back, I think, by uncertainty about uh, the Chinese economy, which is a very big uh, commodity consumer. Um, there's a lot of people have been focusing on Russell 2000, which is um, an index of 2000 smaller, including 2000 smaller companies. Um, and their earnings have been flat or slightly declining for a long time and nobody wanted to buy the Russell index. However, uh, if the US start to cut rates, uh, perhaps aggressively uh, from very soon, either from next week or from from September, that will actually benefit the economics of these, uh, co these companies. By the way, I want to say something about the US economy. So, uh, although the margin has narrowed, Donald Trump is still um, predicted as the most likely winner and uh, and people think that that would be good for the economy. There's one thing we need to know about the US economy and that is the Biden administration has been running absolutely massive fiscal deficit even in a situation with inflation and full employment. So this has been, in my opinion, extremely un... Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, responsible, um, they should have tightened a lot. So whoever becomes the next president in the US doesn't have much wiggle room for financial expansion. And when Donald Trump says that he will cut taxes, um, one has to take it with a grain of salt. So one element is that uh, he made in his presidential period, he made corporate tax cuts, which are set to expire in next year. And so a part of what he would like to do, and he will for sure like to do with that, is to make those uh, permanent. But he also talks about cutting rates even more to 14%. Um, <laughs> I think he chooses 14 and ex instead of 15 because there's a movement to put a floor on international uh, taxes at 15. So he wants to show that he doesn't care about that. Um, and then he says he will finance that with tariffs. Uh, but he doesn't have much wiggle room because um, the Biden, apart from running huge deficits, the Biden administration weirdly has also chosen to finance them with ultra short bills. And that means you have about four trillion new financing necessary for the American government next year out of a $22 trillion economy. Um, so if the financial markets are not happy, if they, uh, if, if they don't have trust in the economy of the US and, um, and in its bonds, it would be difficult to finance these at good terms. So one has to be also short, medium to short term responsible when running the economy. 
Um, but that that that's kind of a side perspective to where we are. So I. Are you seeing uh, a shift now, if we look mainly at maybe the US economy, but also at, at the EU, right? So for a while we've been talking about high inflation. Um, I think you and I both discussed that we think uh, a more deflationary environment is actually uh, quite plausible, especially due to efficiencies or coming efficiencies in, in mm. AI or robotics. I mean, do you think now we'll kind of dip into the territory of yeah a deflationary economy and and potentially uh higher unemployment or at least not a lot of job creation or or do you see that way uh, longer down the line okay so just on unemployment uh i'd like to talk about what goes on in the us because we've seen an increase in unemployment numbers i think um we've seen eight hundred ninety-five thousand increase in unemployment this year so far and that's the worst people and there's a standard model for when unemployment uh, starts to go up you always get a, a recession uh, but when you dig into the number you find that um, a lot of it doesn't come from from companies not hiring or companies laying off staff it comes from more people joining the labor force and that's not a negative in itself um, so it's not a typical, it should not be read as a, as a clear crisis sign as it often is. Um, but in any case, the, the Fed uh, doesn't like that the unemployment goes up, so it's part of their mandate to try to um, control that also. So I, I, don't, I don't see from a, from a macroeconomic point of view where we are now, I don't see a big unemployment issue coming up but if you if you talk about whether ai over the longer term let's say five or ten years will create structural unemployment i think that it probably won't um but of course it's not something we can say with certainty because we have seen we have seen wave after wave of different technologies uh, increasing unit labor productivity across the world uh, without creating structural employment, but people say, yeah, this is different because this technology will impact everyone at the same time. And you can argue to a large degree that AI and, and robots powered by hyper intelligent AI will outcompete everyone. So I, what I think is most likely to happen is that we find new way, new things to do as we've done before. It might be more tur turbulent though, what we do. And you and I have discussed quite a lot UBI, so uni universal basic income. And last time we had a call about it, I had just um, heard actually on a podcast called All In, uh, people discussing this recent um, experiment that's been closed uh, after three years with UBI in the US that shows no benefit for the, for the users at all. It pacified them. Um, it didn't bring them forward in life. And I... I've come to the conclusion that UBI is, is probably a very bad idea. I used to say that um, I was I was a careful proponent. Um, I think that to some degree it can it it can replace some of the complexity of the welfare state, but the people not having to work uh, re deprives them of dignity, of purpose, and I I think that. The, the, the way forward is to use AI to expand the economies enormously, so to, to expand the, the real income and the wealth enormously. And the, all that money will enable us to create new kinds of jobs where the, 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 point, the point that you are human is, uh, is, is, is an advantage in itself. So I think... Uh, a lot of viewers, they, they're wondering about crypto. So, uh, I mean, the, the crash on crypto is equivalent to the crash in, in Japan. Yeah. I mean, uh, do you see that as a crypto bubble or do you just see that like a crypto currency is a, a risky asset, <clears throat> just like tech stocks? So they are always hit the hardest uh, when there's uncertainty in the market. Well, um, sometimes it's been argued that crypto was a safe haven when there was turbulence in financial markets. I don't think there's a 
strong case for that. I think uh, there's a weak case for the opposite, that crypto follows uh, markets in, in many ways. So when it's risk off, uh, it's also risk off from crypto. I, um, I, I do think that what they do with interest rates in the US will impact the longer term trend for, for crypto. Initially, crypto seemed like an entirely speculative uh, thing, but it has really um, uh, also, be, you know, gained ground as as a mean of of, um, of doing trade and transferring wealth from one person to another. So, so I don't think that it's any more a, a completely speculative asset as it might have been viewed as in the beginning. So right now, it seems that bonds is. This is kind of the, the, the easy choice in terms of a good investment. I mean, if interest rates and, and inflation will continue to go down as a result of this, uh, there only seems to be upside on bonds. Would you agree with that? Yeah, we have a fund where by far our biggest position actually is in bond. Unfortunately, they don't move as much as our long position in equities. So um, net net, we still have an issue with this. but. Uh, I think the the long term re- level for American ten year Treasury bonds should stabilize somewhere around three point five to three point seven percent interest rate, um, and uh, we are not down there yet. So I think there's still upside in 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 these bonds, but not a lot because now now the the rates are really coming down, which means that the bonds prices are really coming up. Okay, so, so you actually think they're pretty close to an equilibrium? You don't think that like uh, this kind of crash, if it's a real crash, and uh, maybe really low inflation and, and more unemployment could send them, could send the interest rate down quite a lot further on, on well, it, well it, i mean they could overshoot i was just i'm looking to the side because i'm looking at the prices so the 10-year yield is 3.77 percent and i said you know uh, you know a bit clo- lower than that but not a lot lower so that there's still juice in it but i don't think a lot from here okay so what i can read from you is that you don't believe that this is kind of a trend shift where we'll see a, a deeper recession or, or like um, deflation or or super low interest rates in in the near future. It's, it's probably more like a bump in the way for the investor. Yeah, I would like to conclude with one observation that, that is that you know I've written a book called Business Cycles many years ago. Um, and I took a whole year off to study business cycles in order to re- to to write that book. And um, one of the things that I observed by looking at these long-term time series is that that recessions almost always evolved as some kind of uh, the, the bottlenecks in the economy. Then central banks start raising rates. And until at some point the high interest rates start squeezing in the economy, some, then something cracks and then the whole thing comes down. So this, the situation we have now is very uh, dissimilar, so very different, because inflation has already been falling for a long time going as we move towards weakness in the U.S. economy. And that means it's very, very easy for the Fed, if they think they need to do it, to cut rates. So. Um, if they have, if we had increasing inflation, then they would be torn. You know, what should we prioritize? Killing inflation or helping the economy? But now it's clean, clean that the inflation is under control, so it will be helping the economy. So I think that's is, that's very important to bear in mind. Okay. So maybe we should um, round this off with a little bit of advice for for the private investor out here. Should they do nothing? Should they kind of buy the dip or, or should they carefully start to sell out uh, some of the, the risky assets? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not in the business of giving uh, advice to private investors, at least not if I know them and uh, know about their personal economy. But I would I would just say that the, the way I personally view this is that 
um, you should not think that the world is going into uh, a big recession. This is a technical correction. And these come, and uh, sometimes they're predictable, sometimes not. Uh, think about it as, uh, as I said in the beginning, maybe something similar to the flash crash in 1987. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when, when markets start just six side, sagging sideways, uh, sideways, then it's probably over. That's my best guess. Okay, so maybe a short history <laughs> lesson. So in uh, 87, uh, w w that was a very quick crash or, or correction? As far as I recall, yeah, it was Black Monday. You you had uh, markets that fell twenty five percent in in seven hours, um, and then we were just like, uh, "What was that?" And it just it's it's something that can happen because people get stopped out of position and then people panic and so on, and then a lot of people they read into it that something is really wrong with the economy, um, and and. In that case, there was there was no big problem in the economy. It was just self feeding process, and then it was over. And then it created good uh, opportunities to buy much cheaper than it had been the week before. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Lars. You're welcome. Nice to talk with you again. My pleasure.